Just recently, Cosmic Skeptic and Humane Hancock had a discussion on antinatalism. Alex, Cosmic Skeptic, says that in the video he expresses his first thoughts on the topic as he's just begun to read and think about it. It's only fair to say that one may need to know more about the philosophy to dispel any uncertainties and to have a good ground to make a solid judgment about it. They are both atheists and vegans, so they won't give us any silly excuses bordering on cosmic plan or the purpose of life. And they both understand that suffering, and especially causing suffering, are huge problems. Before continuing, make sure you have first watched the discussion, as I will focus only on a few interesting moments. In the description you will find links to the video itself, but also to additional materials such as other arguments for antinatalism. I'll first comment on some parts of their discussion and add some of my footnotes and maybe a critical remark or a question. I'll end up with mentioning the parts that I particularly liked. Hancock says that the arguments for antinatalism fall under two broad categories. One is concerned with suffering of the person who may potentially come into existence, and the other is concerned with the harm that the potential person may cause to others. Maybe it's a nitpick, but it seems to me like there are other types of arguments. The argument from imposition, or the impossibility to get consent, is more like an argument directed at potential parents, or at the very least, it can be seen in this way. Similarly, with the argument that having children is a selfish act. Alex mentions the Mars thought experiment. We think that it's good that there are no people on Mars suffering, but we don't despair that there aren't any Martians who could experience pleasure. Alex is skeptical whether or not we should be seeing this situation like this. He asks whether perhaps we should introduce life on Mars to increase the pleasure in the universe. He says this is a difference between allowing pleasure not to be on Mars versus preventing suffering on Mars. Allowing something to happen is passive, whereas prevention is an active stance. Prevention requires us to do something. Alex thinks that the Mars example, and by extension the pain-pleasure asymmetry argument, is grounded in this distinction between allowing and preventing. And, according to him, this difference is not clear or not big enough to justify the asymmetry. Or, in other words, the difference is not sufficient to say that potential pleasure counts for nothing, but the potential pain counts for everything. I don't quite get why Alex frames the asymmetry as allowing pleasure versus preventing suffering. One could indeed say that we don't have any obligation to introduce pleasure to the world, just as we don't have any obligation to prevent suffering. But this is not how anyone thinks about the asymmetry or the ethics of procreation as far as I know. So let me frame the argument in another way. There are many risks of bad things that can happen to someone. Child cancer, crippling genetic disorders, abuse, rape, losing loved ones, damaging accidents, depression, and eventually fear of death and the actual dying, which can be long and painful. You never know if any such gloomy suffering will befall a given person. So there is the risk. This is a grave risk. Some types of pain don't happen that often, but when you sum them all, you get cumulative risk of something really bad happening to someone. This is a major risk, because the consequences are grave. Procreation is an active act. It's the creation of a person who will be at risk of many types of pain, such as the ones just mentioned. Harming other sentient beings is morally wrong, just as putting someone in a situation where the person can be harmed is wrong. This is because the person did not consent to be put in such a situation. So procreation is essentially risking the well-being and the life of another person. Yes, you might not agree that the difference between allowing versus preventing is especially interesting. You might not agree that the potential pleasure counts for nothing. But you surely understand that causing suffering and putting someone in harm's way is morally wrong. 
no one would willingly suffer many horrible atrocities that do in fact happen. It's not so much about a moral virtue of preventing suffering, it's about not having the right to risk someone else's welfare. Alex says that there are many reasons why someone is an antinatalist. For example, you can be an antinatalist if you simply hate children. No, that's not how it works. People who don't want children generally refer to themselves as child-free. Antinatalism is an ethical system. Its essential tenet is the immorality of procreation. Hancock notices that the most intense pains are disvalued much more than the most intense pleasures are valued. We much strongly avoid suffering than we seek out pleasure of comparable intensity. Alex seems to be thinking that this automatically is an argument for suicide. If you make an argument that suffering overwhelms pleasures, then you could make an argument for suicide, but it doesn't have anything to do with antinatalism, which is concerned only with procreation. Moreover, even if suffering outweighs pleasure in someone's life, this person has to decide whether the pain is too much. There may be a different threshold of pain for each person, either in a net pain or in absolute measure of pain experienced during some time span. But notice that there is a threshold. I don't see how merely the fact that the pain outweighs pleasure would automatically lead one to conclude that life is not worth continuing. Further, if you are alive, you are in control of your life. So you could decide to continue living or to end your own life. It's your life. This is not transferable to a potential person. You don't have and cannot get consent from this person to live a life of mostly pain. Therefore, you impose life of mostly pain on them. And this is immoral. This is what antinatalism is about. This recognition that, in general, suffering outweighs pleasure is an intuition in many arguments for antinatalism. If your child wins at the game of life, then yeah, she will have fun. But if she loses in the game of life, then she will suffer. She will suffer the consequences of your decision of bringing her into this world. Both Hancock and Alex agree that they would press the red button which would painlessly kill all humans or all life on planet Earth. One very important thing to note is that this counterintuitive conclusion is not specific to negative utilitarianism or antinatalism. Even if you are a positive utilitarian, you are subject to a similar scenario. Simply entertain a hypothetical scenario where you can bring new people to Earth who would be able to enjoy much higher levels of joy than the people who currently live here. But to do that, you first have to kill all humans to do the replacement. So in order to maximize pleasure, you have to essentially press the red button. I'll link an article that goes into greater length in exploring this scenario. I have to share my concern that relates to the red button problem and the rejection of antinatalism by Alex. I may be missing something, but it seems to me like you can't on the one hand say that you reject the idea that the pleasure counts for nothing and on the other hand say that you would painlessly kill all life on the planet. After you press the red button, there will be no pleasure, which you seem to be saying counts for something. Or to put it another way, if you are saying that life is bad enough to warrant elimination, then you are basically saying that life is bad enough to not create more of it, which would make you an antinatalist. But when asked by Hancock whether Alex is an antinatalist, he says no. Hancock also says that he would push the button. Hancock also says that he would push the button. Okay, so we have two people who recognize that the suffering on this planet is so great, so horrible, that it would be better if there was no life on Earth. 
Yet they think it's morally justifiable to bring new people into this world to experience this suffering that they would rather eliminate with the red button. I watched the video a few times, but I still can't understand what's going on here. Hancock presents Alex with a nearly factual statement. If Alex will ever have a child, it will grow up, likely have children of their own, will grow old, will see their loved ones die, and eventually they will be ravaged by disease and die. Alex's response isn't satisfying. He says that when a person suffers greatly only at the end, then this problem becomes the question about the balance of pain and pleasure. Clearly, Alex doesn't agree with the asymmetry, but still, Alex should respond to the fact that in this hypothetical situation he would create a being that will inevitably suffer, so he would be responsible for that suffering. And for what? What would be the justification for bringing this person into existence? Alex presents what he thinks is the most powerful argument against antinatalism, the intuitive repulsion to the idea that a broken fingernail outweighs the pain-pleasure balance in the non-existent side. I strongly disagree. This is not an argument against antinatalism at all. Because this scenario, where someone has a life full of bliss with only one minor pinprick, is simply impossible. You can't defeat antinatalism with an impossible case. Also, you are considering only one life, but it's also impossible that all people would experience only joy with just a broken fingernail of discomfort. Which means that creating new lives would lead to some people living mostly bliss and some people would be like normal people of today, with different experiences of suffering. You could at best say that this example makes the pain-pleasure asymmetry unintuitive and difficult to accept, but it doesn't defeat the whole philosophy of antinatalism. Antinatalism is much more than one line of argumentation. Okay, one last nitpick. When asked why he's not an antinatalist, Alex responds that it's because he rejects the asymmetry of pain and pleasure. You can't really say that. If you would accept the asymmetry, then you would be committed to antinatalism. The proper reversal would be to say that you are not an antinatalist, so you reject the asymmetry. You can't say that you're not an antinatalist only because you reject the asymmetry, as there are many arguments for antinatalism. It would be fair to say that you're not an antinatalist because you reject all the arguments that you know there are. The last thing I want to mention in this part is this. Alex and Hancock are aware of the suffering that takes place in Animal Kingdom. They are both vegans. They also know that wild animals suffer. They suffer from disease, from being killed by other animals, from defects, from having their children killed, etc. The Earth is a horror show. I would recommend both Alex and Hancock watching some videos and reading about ethelism. It's a philosophy created by Inmendum on YouTube. It directly tackles the problem of suffering of all sentient life. You can think about it as a generalization of antinatalism to all sentient life. I'll post some links in the description. Alright, now let's go to the praise part. Near the very beginning, Alex makes a distinction between what is merely preferred by someone versus what is generally preferable. This is an important distinction to make as it preempts some flawed counter-arguments. Alex also notices that just because someone prefers or wants something doesn't mean that he has the right to bring that about. This is crucial to morality in general. This is the case with immorality of rape, immorality of abusing animals for taste sensations, and antinatalists would argue this is also the case for bringing people into existence to satisfy one's desire to have a baby and be a parent. Hancock presents a common counter-argument to antinatalism. What if we someday find alien life that we could help? 
Alex responds by saying that if we were to take into account all potential things that may happen, then we couldn't do anything. We have to think what is likely to happen, as we cannot take into account everything that could possibly happen. Alex said that he's uncertain whether or not he should press the red button, but then identifies that there is a difference between psychological analysis and the ethical analysis. So just because he's uncertain and he doesn't know what he would do, it's a different problem than determining what is the correct answer what we should do. Hancock asks, will antinatalism ever take off? To which Alex responds that some time ago, veganism, anti-racism, women's suffrage were not accepted, but laughable. The power of the argument should take it forward. Whether antinatalism will become popular depends on two things, whether the argument is true and whether people will actually take it seriously and think about it. Near the very end, Alex says something that can only give hope to anyone listening, no matter whether they agree with antinatalism or not. And then you just started reading about it. It's, it's open for debate, but I'm one of those people who is willing to take it seriously. Mm. Of course I'm willing to take it seriously. Any, anybody who claims to have a way to minimize unnecessary suffering, I'm going to give them the time of day, right? And, and if they've put their argument in a, in a concise way that actually makes sense and has some kind of persuasive power, then damn right it's worth engaging with, mm. even if just to reject it. So it kind of tires me out when people aren't even willing to engage with it. Not, but it's fine if you don't have the time, if you're not interested, if that's not what you want to do. But people who are like, I'm not going to engage with that because it's ridiculous. Mm. I, I, I just don't think that they've uh, paid enough attention. And that is all. Definitely subscribe to Cosmic Skeptic and Humane Hancock. They do a really good job in critical thinking and in veganism. And I'm sure we can expect more videos from them on challenging topics. And I invite you to check out the links in the description to learn more about antinatalism and ethelism.